Thank you, Carolyn, for this beautiful invitation to share what I think I love most in the world, these teachings of the dark night of the soul that are so paradoxically consoling in these rough waters that, that we're in collectively. So thank you everyone for making your way to this uh, little campfire in the wilderness, just what these, these spaces feel like when we can gather by whatever means are available to us to really drop down into the depths of our souls and not squander this opportunity that the pandemic and these major global shifts are offering to us right now. So thanks for saying yes to that, all of you. Thank you. So I'd like to uh, begin by lighting a candle, and invoking sacred space, and asking you to join me in just settling into this moment right now, giving ourselves permission to just be right here, nowhere else to go, nothing to accomplish, just, in, just allowing ourselves to, to rest in what is. So I light this candle now in honor of each of you for whatever it has taken for you to make your way to this moment, all of the moments of your life that have led to this one. And I call upon the ancestors and the unseen beings who surround us and support us and are available to us. And I give thanks for the opportunity to do this deep exploration of the soul in community with all of you. Thank you. So I invite you to join me now and just settling into your seat allowing yourself to just kind of take root exactly where you are. And we'll take, in a moment, three deep breaths. You're gonna breathe in all the way and hold the in-breath for a few beats. And then exhale completely and hold the exhalation for a few beats. This is what we're gonna do in a moment at your own pace. It'll be three deep breaths and I invite you to kind of linger in the empty spaces between the breaths. Allow yourself to become intimate with the full arc of the breath and that liminal threshold space between the breaths. So begin now breathing in deeply and then you're gonna hold the inhalation. And then at your own pace, you will exhale completely and hold the exhalation before breathing in again. Feeling the way the breath washes over you, invigorating and calming at the same time. Honing your attention and relaxing you. Taking your time. And whenever you've taken your full deep breaths, just rest in the natural rhythm of your breathing for a moment inviting yourself to completely inhabit this present moment, saying yes to it, giving yourself the gift of this short hour together to let the rest of the compulsions of your day fall away. Just here, just this.
Feel yourself rooted to this earth. Feel your rightful place in this web of interbeing to which you belong. We belong to each other. Take refuge here. I'd like to begin by reading a prayer from this book, Mother of God, Similar to Fire. This is a book of icons of Mother Mary by Father Bill McNichols, iconographer, priest. Lots of different images of Mary. And he asked me to write a prayer for each one of these 50 icons of Mary. And the title icon is Mother of God, Similar to Fire. This is actually the, the ancient name of this orthodox icon that Father Bill interpreted for our times. This is her, her completion, her totality. And so I'm going to read the opening prayer that I wrote for this collection, Mother of God, Similar to Fire. Mother of God, Similar to Fire, Ignite my heart in prayer. Where once I stood on familiar ground, selecting my spiritual experiences like choice morsels from a well-tended larder, now my garden has gone up in flames, and I thirst only for the living God. Let me find the beloved, Mother, as you do deep inside my own ripened being. Let me swallow the sacred and burn with that presence, illuminating a way home to the truth. Lit from within, let my blazing heart be a sanctuary for the weary traveler until this long night lifts and dawn unfolds her new radiance. So I want to acknowledge as we dive in now that many of you are bringing great pain and sorrow to this moment. Or even if it isn't radical suffering that you carry presently, you may be coming to this space with a sense of deep soul weariness, of dryness, aridity, um, anxiety. So a, a whole degree of, of discontent may be present. I mean, a whole range of degrees of discontent may be present as we drag our weary asses to this moment to see if there's any way that these 500-year-old teachings of the dark night of the soul offered to us by a Spanish Carmelite priest have any relevance and usefulness for our particular personal subjective state in this moment. And also, if there's any way that it can meet our yearning to be of some help in the world in alleviating suffering where we encounter it, wherever we encounter it. You know, that, that deep longing to be a lamp in the darkness for others. So that's what we're exploring over this next uh, few, these sessions, these six sessions of the dark night of the soul, is how this can be a map for navigating the darkness of our times 
and the obscurity of what might be happening in our own being. I woke up early this morning, I shared this with Carolyn this morning, with this image that what I was hoping to do with you during this series is to trace a map in the palm of your hand so that you could find your way in the dark, that you'd feel, feel the fingertips guiding you when it feels like there's no clear way forward. Now, of course, the beauty of the dark night of the soul is that it only feels like darkness. It looks like darkness because what it really is is unutterable radiance. And our eyes, the eyes of our soul, are not accustomed to perceiving the direct luminescence of the divine light. And so at first we perceive it as darkness. You know, like when we're in a darkened room, John of the Cross says, and we go out into the sunlight, we can't see a thing at first. We have to get used to it, or we have to develop new eyes with which to perceive the light directly, because that's the definition of a mystic, right? A mystic is one who has a direct experience of the divine, unmediated through any of the kind of conventional channels, authority figures, intermediaries of any sort, uh, prescribed prayers and practices and, and reliable established methodologies for getting to God. All of that goes up in flames for a mystic. And all of the boundaries melt and she is poured into a direct encounter of love, an I-thou relationship, Martin Buber calls it. So many of us are feeling like we've been in this prolonged state of unknowing, a kind of darkness as a result of this COVID-19 pandemic that is going on a year and a half now in, in real time. Let's see, is that right? February, March, April, May, well, not, not even, you know, 14 months maybe. Feels like forever in some ways. And we're starting to get used to the liminal territory that we're finding ourselves in but it's also starting to wear on many of us. Even those of us who feel like we've got our shit together in some ways, we've got an established spiritual practice, we have community maybe. Um, it's been extraordinary how community has been able to develop and flourish in uh, virtual spaces during this pandemic. You know, that maybe in the past we thought technology was an obstacle to connection true authentic connection and in fact we're finding that it is a portal to very deep and powerful connection but maybe that we're we're ready for for more face-to-face uh, -face, body to body contact and it's still not not really available and we don't really know when it will be and so it may be that we're starting to feel worn down by the the limitations of this lockdown. And we're also noticing that cherished structures that we've relied upon, that we've just been comfortable with and taken for granted, uh, that we have even felt entitled to partake in, are collapsing. I mean, people like Andrew Harvey have been sounding the clarion call of the prophet for years, decades, saying, watch out, your comfortable little universe is going to go up in flames. The world as we knew it is going to become unrecognizable because we as a human family have pushed the, the entire mechanism to the brink of complete failure. And now, here we are. And so, both personally and collectively, we find ourselves in a place of radical unknowing, of 
soul weariness, of anxiety, and a sense of uh, yearning to be able to do something about it, and yet feeling, many of us, powerless to affect any kind of fix on the broken gizmo of the universe. What John of the Cross does is invites us to actually abide in that state of radical unknowingness to, and to rest there, to take refuge there. He says that when a dark night of the soul descends upon us, it's a sign of spiritual maturity that we have grown strong enough to be weaned from the divine breast and walk on our own two feet, to eat the crusty bread of robust grown-ups. I found this um, wonderful poem, prayer, offering by, by the Buddhist teacher Jennifer Wellwood that I want to read to you. Uh, um, she's a, in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, and the Dakini is this wild, kind of capricious, feminine spirit in Tibetan Buddhism who pulls the rug out from under us whenever we get complacent. So the Dakini speaks. See if this speaks to you. It feels like John of the Cross could have written it as a girl in the 21st century. My friends, let's grow up. Let's stop pretending we don't know the deal here. Or, if we truly haven't noticed, let's wake up and notice. Look, everything that can be lost will be lost. It's simple. How could we have missed it for so long? Let's grieve our losses fully, like ripe human beings. But please, let's not be so shocked by them. Let's not act so betrayed, as though life had broken her secret promise to us. Impermanence is life's only promise to us, and she keeps it with ruthless impeccability. To a child she seems cruel, but she is only wild, and her compassion is exquisitely precise, brilliantly penetrating, luminous with truth. She strips away the unreal to show us the real. This is the true ride. Let's give ourselves to it. Let's stop making deals for a safe passage. There isn't one anyway, and the cost is too high. We are not children anymore. The true human adult gives everything for what cannot be lost. Let's dance the wild dance of no hope. Now, Jennifer Wellwood is, is a Buddhist who doesn't subscribe to a personified deity the way John of the Cross does. For John of the Cross, God, who he calls the Beloved, is definitely an intimate partner on the journey to awakening. But whether you're non-theistic or madly in love with a God that you sometimes believe in with your mind and sometimes can't, there is an invitation in the dark night of the soul to allow all of our preconceptions and all of our attachments to juicy spiritual feelings of connectedness to dry up and fall away and not freak out when that happens.